Okay, so today we're going to finish chapter four, and uh, we're going to be talking about the next set of techniques, more advanced techniques in the evolution to enhancing uh, performance. So building up um, what we have uh, covered already. So before we start talking about it, uh, and the topic really, the, the broader topic is called instruction level parallelism. And what that really means is how do we execute more than one instruction or how do we get a completion rate of more than one instruction per clock cycle. And you have heard me talk about superscalar. So that approach is actually one way of implementing instruction level parallelism. So we step back to be the beginning of the chapter. We started talking about an implementation of a single cycle uh, data path and everything got done in a single cycle. Now that is that's actually good. We want to why take more than a single cycle to complete an instruction? So that is good, but with that simple approach, we had to do everything in that cycle. So that made it such that the period was long because we had to accommodate all the functionality of the hardware in a single cycle. So having a long period or, uh, or a low frequency, that's not good. Well, then another approach would be to break down although we didn't cover it here in the lecture, but you saw it in, in your lab uh, number three, break down the steps of the instruction and just do a little bit of the instruction in each clock cycle. Now, since you're doing less per clock cycle, that compresses your period. It gets your uh, frequency up, and that's a good thing. But now you're taking multiple cycles to uh, execute an instruction. So that's not so good. Now, when we introduced pipeline, the pipelining, the idea was to take the, the best of those two approaches and say, we want to do a little bit of instruction in each clock cycle, but at the same time, we want a completion rate. So still each individual instruction is going to take more than one cycle, but now because we are pipelining and reusing or using the resources or in every clock cycle, all the resources of the, of the pipeline, we're going to get a completion rate of one clock cycle. So now we have a high frequency because we have shortened what gets done in a single clock cycle from a hardware perspective. In a sense, what's being done within um, adjacent pipeline registers. So that gives you a higher frequency. And the fact that you are completing an instruction on every, every cycle gives you that uh, CPI of one, which is the, the ideal, the ideal uh, CPI that you can get uh, on a pipeline uh, implementation. So barring any of the real issues that we talked about, like hazards. Um, so now we have a CPI of one and we have high frequency. So great. The next step is how do we go beyond that? So how do we get a CPI that is less than one or the inverse of the CPI, which is the IPC, the instructions per clock. And how do we get a completion rate of multiple instructions per single clock? And that's where instruction level parallelism comes in. How can we execute several instructions and complete several instructions in parallel in a single clock cycle? Okay. Now, be one one short stop towards that is to just increase the clock to get more performance because the overarching goal is to increase the performance. So one one idea there, which is has nothing to do with instruction level parallelism, but it's an easy an easy thing to do in our way to increasing performance is to make the pipeline deeper. So longer pipeline, that allows us to increase the clock rate or the frequency. 
increases performance, but we're still completing one instruction per cycle, best case. And when we get into instruction level parallelism, what we want to do is how do we now issue multiple instructions during the same clock cycle, try to complete them, uh, try to complete multiple instructions per clock cycle. And that is the essence of instruction level parallelism. And to do that, since I have a single pipeline that is busy all the time, ideally, what we're going to do is replicate the pipeline. We'll see that in real practice, not exactly. We're not just going to replicate the pipeline because we could have pipelines for different things. We could have a pipeline that is uh, better suited to do memory interaction instructions like load stores. We can have a pipeline that is better suited for the logical and arithmetic instructions. We could have a pipeline that does some vector type uh, computation and is suitable for multimedia <clears throat> data processing. We could have a floating point pipeline that just, you know, just is going to do the floating point instructions. So they don't need to be to be the same, but the point is that by having multiple pipelines, whether they are the same or not, you're going to be able to issue multiple instructions in a single clock cycle. And depending on the mix by studying code, what architects do is say, I may need one pipeline that is for floating point, I may need one for interaction with memory, load store, and I may need two for arithmetic and logical instructions because I have a lot of those. So they can look at the mix of instructions from real code and study in that and come up with that organization. But that's the idea that we're going to see here. When we talk about multiple issue, then there are two buckets that we can talk about. One is static and dynamic. And they are, the differences uh, are well understood. What we're going to call a static multiple issue is that the compiler, we're going to put, we're going to put the hardware in place to be able to support the multiple issue of instructions. But we're going to put the smart, the figuring out how to do it as you progress through the code at the machine level or uh, assembly level. We're going to put that on us on the compiler. So the compiler as is building the code is going to look at it and it's going to figure out how can I group these instructions into these macro issue slots that when it gets fetched, now I'm issuing multiple instructions per clock cycle. And the compiler then is going to have to look at the code, try to avoid the hazards, replace instructions, and group them in a way that makes sense that they can be executed independently. That's what we call static multiple issue. Now, the compiler knows how the code looks statically, but it doesn't know what's really going to happen dynamically as the code is really running when it's being used. So it has that disadvantage. But on the hardware side, it's much simpler to support a static multiple issue than the other way, which would be dynamic multiple issue. Now, for dynamic, the compiler doesn't need to worry about it. It can do some primitive uh, chores to, to try to avoid the hazards, but really it's is not going to be highly intelligent to reorder the code. It is hardware in the actual CPU that is going to be fetching a stream or prefetching instructions and looking at over a close degree of locality, spatial temporal locality, which we'll talk about in chapter five, uh, at that code stream and it's going to try to dynamically reordered instructions to issue multiple instructions to the pipelines that are in parallel. And then dynamically also is going to try to resolve <clears throat> the hazards. So let's, let's look at those two, um, two approaches.
Of course, uh, one of the things that you're going to encounter in, in the static uh, multiple issue is that the compiler, since it doesn't have any, any knowledge of what's really happening uh, when the, the software is being run, is that it has to speculate, it has to guess some things. And if the compiler happened to be incorrect, then the hardware has to roll back and, and fix it. So in a sense, that causes more of a penalty when, when you're wrong. But the idea is, is in itself pretty, um, pretty simple. So again, compiler reordered instructions um, and the hardware basically fixes uh, if there are any issues if the compiler was, was wrong. Now what makes this really, I don't want to say a bad idea, but a, an inferior approach than dynamic uh, speculation is that when you get exceptions, when you get exceptions, when you get interrupts, uh, that that really throws complexity into the dynamic nature of the running of the software. Although there are techniques that can be done, like the ISA can support that uh, and, su and support what is called the fairing exceptions and alleviate that, that problem. If we have issues with exceptions, then in a dynamic approach, you can buffer those exceptions. So essentially hold them off until the instruction is complete and then uh, address the exception. And it may be that the instruction doesn't complete. So it needs to know. So you can see that all this that we're talking about, all these mechanisms, think about them, what it would take to put them in hardware, because you have to put them in hardware. And now you're very familiar with the hardware description language. So you do have a tool to describe complex hardware in a way that is very productive. And that's why um, we want to teach you that that uh, that language so let's keep talking about static multiple issue again the compiler groups instructions into what is called an issue packet and those are the ones the compiler sees as the highest possibility they're close by they can there's going to try to reduce the uh, or minimize or uh, eliminate the hazards and is going to issue that into that issue packet. And then this issue packet can be seen as a single word even though it's made up of multiple words. That a specific approach also when you have a static multiple issue is also referred to as a very long instruction word architecture because you, you have multiple instructions as a single instruction entering the processor, which is made up of these parallel pipelines. So again, compiler uh, must remove uh, as many hazards as it can and reorder uh, and the instructions, come up, uh, build the packets and uh, the main thing is it has to be much more sophisticated than when it, when it doesn't have to worry about it. And then if, there, if it cannot fill the issue packet with useful instructions, then you just put an O op, uh, an O operation instruction in that for that, and uh, it sends them in. Uh, the ISA of course, uh, needs to support this, but perhaps the most important thing is that the compiler needs to know now a lot about the implementation of the pipeline as a, um, as a multiple pipeline 
uh, implementation of the processor. So it's not the knowledge of the compiler doesn't end at the instruction set. It needs to know about the implementation. So that information needs to be communicated uh, as part of the overarching instruction set architecture specification. So let's look at a simple example with instructions that you are familiar with and with the leg V8 um, subset of the IS, of the ARM ISA that we have been looking at. You could envision uh, making your own uh, multiple issue architecture for or implementation to support two concurrent instructions in the pipeline. And we'll see that what we have been looking at is pretty simple. So we don't really even need to replicate the pipeline. We just need to replicate some hardware and some resources in some of the stages of the pipeline. But one way to, um, to approach this example and at least illustrate that in the hardware that you have been looking at is to say, we're going to be able to on the same stage or through the same pipeline path, we're going to be able to execute an a ALU or branch instruction together at the same time as one load store instruction. So you can think of this, this uh, approach is superimposing a pipeline for the ALU on branch instruction and a pipeline for the load store uh, memory interaction instructions. So if you look at it, uh, in the pipeline stages that we have looked at, instruction fetch, decode, execution, memory of writeback, uh, we have, if we order the code statically, so that we have an ALU or branch instruction, and the next one is a load or, or a store, then we can fetch them at the same time. <clears throat> So this gives you the idea of the parallel pipelines. We fetch them at the same time, we decode them at the same time, executing, do the memory part, and the write back, and so on, okay? So you can see that when you get here, if you can sustain this, you are completing two instructions per clock cycle instead of one. So now your performance has doubled. Of course, that's assuming that you can come up with this, and again, for static uh, instruction level parallelism approach, the onus is on the compiler. But that will give you an idea of what we're talking about for the hardware that, we, that you have seen. If you wanted to look at the hardware support for that, here we have to replicate the sign extension because one is for the load on a store and the other one is for the ALU type instructions. We have to replicate the ALU because we need to build, we need to build the address for the load on a store while this one is doing, while this one is doing the arithmetic type instructions. We know that the arithmetic type doesn't go through the memory, uh, but this one does. This is the load and store. And then these are the two write back paths. We also have to make our register file more sophisticated so we can actually have dual read ports and dual write ports and again here we have the two outputs that get read and the two outputs that get read for the memory this is for the LU this is for the memory type instruction and uh, we have to replicate that hardware and as we work backwards then here from the instruction memory we need to be able to fetch the two instructions on a single cycle but that gives you an idea. Of course, this is a simplified diagram, 
but that at a minimum, these are the beginnings of what you will have to start thinking about to replicate hardware to support the dual issue in the data path, the pipeline data path that we have been talking about for the leg, uh, the leg V8. So for this example, uh, what can happen? We can still do forwarding. So we didn't draw all that, but all the forwarding mechanism that we discuss uh, can still be used. And we will have to address that for each path for the uh, ALU type instructions and also for the memory type. We'll have to manage the stalls uh, for the load type uh, instruction, as we saw before. Okay. So we still have to do all that. But the key is to be able to schedule these instructions in the way that we showed at the beginning, uh, alter alternating between load store and ALU or branch instruction or vice versa. <clears throat> so what would be an example of scheduling? So here, we have a load and it's loading into register X0. Uh, and here, here we're using X0 as a um, as a source. Then and as a destination as well. Here we're using it as a destination. And then we have these two instructions over here that is using X20 as a source and destination and here as a destination. And then we have a branch instruction. Here we have a table of both pipelines. These are for the ALU or branch instructions. And this would be for the load store type instructions. So let's see how we would reorder this because we get that best case scenario here, if we are not talking about instruction level parallelism, the best case is that we get one instruction completed per clock cycle as the instructions go through the pipeline. So that is the best case is, is one, okay? If we have two, two pipelines, at least conceptually, the way we're talking about one pipeline for ALU and branch and one pipeline for load and store, even though in the diagram they were sort of bunched together, um, but they were there. Then ideally, the maximum, the best case number of instructions that you can complete per clock cycle we know is two. But let's see, as we reorder this code and schedule it for the dual issue, what is it that we really get? So first, we know that the first instruction is this load. So this one, we're going to put here. And we cannot really do any instruction, at least for this segment of code. We can really not do any other instruction uh, as the compiler looks at the at the code. So we're going to put a no op in this slot over here. Then we're going to do the subtract instruction. So we, are, we see that the dependency here is such that we can submit it here. And we are going to put an O up here because of the dependency. We cannot do the store because we haven't done the um, we have not done the add. Now we do the add and we have a no op here. 
and now we do the comparison here. This this is a typo, by the way. This should be a no op, okay? And now we do the branch in parallel with the store. So what you're going to see is that you're not going to get two, you're going to get better than one, and this is kind of a sort of a horrible case, uh, just to illustrate this type of dependency issues and complexity with the dual issue, but you could calculate that what you're getting is a instructions per clock cycle of 1.17. When you calculate the number of instructions that you completed um, and the number of clock cycles that it took. So this is, uh, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and five. This should be actually six over five, okay? This, that's a typo as well. <clears throat> and whatever that is, six over five, I'm not sure if it's 1.17, but you can see that it's going to be greater than one, which is the best case that you get without a dual issue, but you don't get quite the best case, which is two for dual issue in terms of instructions per clock cycle or IPC. <clears throat> Another technique that is used in a static issue is loop on rolling, which is that instead of using branches to implement loops, you unroll the loop, and this is very feasible if you know the number of times that you have to execute the body of the loop, and it's not a huge number. You can unroll the loop and treat it as just sequential type of instructions. It increases your code size in the amount of memory that your binary file takes, which is fine, uh, but it allows you to statically issue multiple instructions in an easier manner for the compiler. So let's look at um, an example of loop and rolling. Um, you can see instructions like this um, and you may end up with um, an IPC of close to two. Okay. Now loop on rolling does cost more registers. So that's that's the price that, that you pay or one of the prices that you pay. And that is fine. Uh, normally, this type of um, ISA support you know, a large number of registers, so this is feasible. And I think that this this here, these instructions here, are typos. They should be no ops. And then uh, we will count the number of instructions and the number of cycles, and we will get the uh, the IPC. Now let's talk about dynamic multiple issue, and that is what is really termed uh, superscalar uh, architecture or processors. And as I mentioned at the beginning of today, that's where the processor has hardware in place to decide how to issue multiple instructions during each clock cycle, avoiding hazards. So again, the compiler doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, it can help some, but the main responsibility of doing this is on actual hardware that exists in the processor. Now the idea here is to issue as many instructions to keep the pipelines busy including out-of-order instructions and have the result but then not commit them 
to the state of the machine. And remember, the state of the machine, as far as the programmer is concerned, is the register file. So at the end, commit those instructions in a way that restores the order and takes care of the dependencies. So one organization that is uh, largely used, and you will see some examples of that uh, later on today, and certainly, um, and they are very busy examples because they are of real processors. So I'm just going to highlight what they are without going in detail through them. But when you get these slides later on today or tomorrow, then you should stop by those slides that are very busy and that would be unrealistic and very tedious to go through them in this setting. But I spend time looking at them, studying them, and comparing it to this very simple type of uh, conceptual representation that we are going to spend some time on. So this is an organization that is largely, largely uh, used in superscalar architecture, is that you have an instruction fetch and decode unit, which also is in charge of doing prefetch. Because remember that it has to look at a stream of instructions, at a, at, a, at, a, uh, at a block of instructions, to be able to try to reorder, uh, if, if possible, uh, identify dependencies, and try to issue as many instructions to the multiple parallel pipelines as possible. And let's say that you normally have several what is called integer pipelines, which is for your ALU and um, your logical type of instructions. You normally have a floating point pipeline and you have a load store uh, type of pipeline for interacting with memory. From this instruction and fetch a unit, the instructions get issued, and what is needed for those instructions are stored in what, is, what are called reservation stations, which communicates with what is down here, the commit unit, which is what is in charge of actually writing to the register file, which is not shown here, but also communicates with the reservation stations to pass along results that are needed by instructions that are waiting to be issued into the different pipelines. So one thing that you can do is in order issue, if you can, and then hold pending operands in the reservation stations that can come from the register file or from the commit unit. So you should recognize that, that this is a kind of uh, forwarding. So this picks up where the concept of forwarding left off. And then at the end, the commit unit reorders, is, is, hol is holding the, the results in a buffer and reorders that buffer and actually writes to the registers. So that, and, <clears throat> and there are specific algorithms that are beyond the scope of this course to manage this mechanism. So one such uh, algorithm is called Tomazulo's algorithm. And you can look that up and uh, study it and learn about it, but it, it is beyond the, um, the scope of the course, but we just, we just want to show the concept of how one possible concept, the most popular one, really, on how to approach the dynamic scheduling of multiple instructions in superscalar architectures.
So this is everything that uh, I discussed. So I'm just going to uh, go through these slides swiftly. Um, speculation refers to, of course, the um, the issuing of instructions, uh, speculating that a hazard is not going to occur. So again, why do we want to do this, even though it's, it's a lot more complex? And it's really because the compiler cannot foresee the dynamic nature and what's really happening during during the time that the code is running. That's that's the real reason. Uh, so it cannot predict everything as accurately as the hardware that is looking at the nature of the code as it's run um, can. So the speculation of the compiler is going to be less successful than the speculation of the dynamic hardware in the processor. So does this work? Well, as you saw this example, yes, it works, but it's, you're not going to get the, um, the ideal just because you have five pipelines in parallel, you're not going to be able to sustainably complete five instructions per clock cycle. But we'll take anything that we can. And even if it means putting a lot of complex hardware in the processor, because it is inexpensive to put this with the number of transistors that we can afford on, on chips. So uh, that's, that's the real reason. It doesn't work uh, probably even close to the, um, the theoretical limits. But again, it works well enough that it is worth putting it in uh, because again, we, we, can, we can afford to put a lot of transistors on, on chips. It does increase power. This is these approaches are complex, and there is a point that there is so much that you can do. As we look at power as another dimension, it's not just cost. Power probably is more important, and it is because we can put a lot more transistors on chips that now instead of instead of making very complex multiple issues schemes and mechanisms, it is just better to make those mechanisms simpler, but then have multiple cores to still get not so much instruction level parallelism because at the core level, but you have code level parallelism. So if the parallelism is looser, it goes back to putting more the honors of the compiler uh, to make use of it. And that dynamic goes back and forth. Um, but it gets to the point that it is, from a power perspective, uh, it is more efficient to put more cores. And this is uh, an example of different cores uh, that are using out of order or super scalar approach. Uh, not super recent, uh, but that gives you an idea. And here is probably one of the processors that dissipated the most power before uh, multi core became predominant. Kind of <clears throat> made people wake up that this was a real issue. So 103 watts, if you ever touched a 100 watt uh, light bulb, you know how hot that is. Um, so that gives you an idea. Clock rates, this is interesting. Pipeline stages. So look at the pipeline stages. I said that um, this is what we call super pipeline uh, with very deep pipeline. So 31 stages with the Pentium 4 press cut um, here. <clears throat> mm. 
present and made more relevant uh, is an example of multi-core implementations of more recent processors. So here we have the Intel Core i7 um, targeted to servers and the cloud. So not to the PC. In this one, 130 watts at this speed. The power being dissipated because of the multiple cores, not because of the frequency, because it ran at a lower frequency than the Pentium 4 for desktops. Um, multiple issue, dynamic multiple issue. Uh, here, peak instructions per clock cycle. So this number tells you how many pipelines you have in parallel. So here, this one has two. And each pipeline has eight stages. This one has four pipelines in parallel. Each pipeline has 14 stages. Okay. This one uses static. This one uses dynamic and out of order and it speculates. Uh, some of the issues um, and techniques that we have discussed about brand prediction. So two level brand pr uh, prediction. Um, this one says hybrid. I'm not sure where that really but that could mean a number of things. Um, <clears throat> this definitely uh, this is for mobile devices. So definitely with clock rate, uh, very conscious of power. Uh, just the the one arm core, the hundred milliwatts. And of course, they're talking about the core here that you implement and put in all the chips. There is a lot of the power that is because of the actual buffers to come in and out of the chip that this one would have. This one, so it's not an apples to apples comparison. This is my my point here. Okay. Some information about the caches. Um, up to three levels of cache here. Two levels here. We're going to see in the next chapter. Everything that you would want to know about caches, we're going to talk about it and more. So this gives you a contrast of two different processors for two different, very, very different applications. This is for mobile devices, very low power per core to be integrated in some other chip for a specific mobile devices. This is an actual physical chip to be used in a board to make a, a server that you would put in a uh, in a cloud type of uh, server farm. And these are some examples of the actual implementation of multiple pipelines. So here's the that instruction fetch and prediction unit, the instruction decode. And we'll see what the DLB is. That's the translatable Lucasi buffer. That is related to the cache and to the um, virtual memory. So that we'll discuss that in chapter five. Here we have, um, so here's just the instruction and fetch and prediction. Here we have the instruction decoding. And we have a floating point unit here and an integer unit and load store together here. So that is the on ARM Cortex uh, implementation and some data from benchmarks. So again, we have two, two conceptual pipelines. So the, uh, the performance, the ideal CPI is 0.5. So that's this one here. That's the ideal CPI and uh, Anything that is beyond that is this degradation because you want a CPI as low as possible. So the idea is 0.5 because it has two conceptual pipelines. But as you run a specific software benchmarks, you can see the different levels of degradation um, on real software. What we need to keep sight of 
is that if you didn't have the dual pipeline, this would be worse. So any improvement is good improvement. And this is the organization of that other processor, the Intel for the uh, for the server. So here we have the memory interface uh, instruction cache here, and the prefetching and pre-decoding, and the prefetch buffer over here. Then the instruction queue and the multiple issue. We have hardware to actually do dynamic loop and rolling. And here we have a reservation station, the register file, the different parts of the different pipelines here. So these are the four one, two, three, and four are actually here. And then the commit unit uh, and data memory interface that interfaces with the data cache. This diagram and the previous one is the one that you need to spend some time on just trying to see in here the concepts that we discussed a few slides ago when we introduce the concept of the reservation stations, the commit unit, and the multiple issue uh, of dynamic uh, of the dynamic approach. So here we have what else do we have here? We have floating point multiplier, floating point uh, divide. So all that is part of the same uh, pipeline. And here's some. Uh, performance data on some benchmarks. So again, this has a four conceptual pipelines in parallel. So the best case CPI is going to be a quarter. So this is the ideal case. Anything beyond this uh, stronger shade of blue is degradation just from real hazards and stalls and uh, misspeculation in the dynamic issuing of instructions. So you can see that different hardware is going to perform differently. And here is the penalty because of branch misprediction. So you can see the different percentages for different benchmarks. And very well said and stated, this percentage, uh, because of branch misprediction, is what is called wasted work. So, you, but is a real, is a real part of um, just dealing with the nature of a software that is running in real time. Um, this is just uh, an example that matrix multiplication is a good candidate for um, loop and rolling. So that's the C code and assembly code. So um, just interesting, uh, no, nothing uh, earth shattering there. So, but that does have the type of uh, software construct uh, that are lend itself to loop on rolling. So matrix or parallel process, uh, parallel vector processing of arithmetic instructions, which are um, very typical of uh, matrix arithmetic. And this is the impact of code that is not optimized. So what, what amount of gigaflops, or this would be billion of floating uh, operations per second, 
unoptimized code, optimized, and optimized with loop on rolling. So you can see that it's a sizable uh, performance increase, more than 2x. Uh, of course, just with the optimization, without loop on rolling, you get um, more than 3x improvement here. But from that one, you get more than 2x with the on rolling. Although remember, it does cost uh, more registers. So architectures with or ISAs with a small number of registers uh, are not going to be able to do loop on rolling well, or may not do it at all, may not be able to do it at all. So as we round up or uh, finish up the chapter, uh, some final ideas. Uh, so hopefully you can appreciate that the actual concept of pipelining is easy, the basic idea. It is this uh, hazards and the nature of software running in real time that make it hard to actually uh, get that or get closer to that ideal benefit. Um, and again, it does it does require complexity, hardware complexity to manage that at the hardware level. So <clears throat> uh, as we were able to put more transistors in on chips, we were able to implement more sophisticated hardware approach for dynamic uh, multiple issue. And uh, when you got to the point that Hard, uh, power be became a problem, then we sort of stopped making uh, more sophisticated dynamic multiple issue uh, designs in favor of just having more, more cores. One thing to keep in mind is that, as we were, uh, we were mentioning that you want a large number of registers, you want um, regularity of instructions, minimization of uh, instruction formats and addressing modes. So all this simplicity that we started to talk about back in chapter two, when designing an ISA helps tremendously, tremendously to put in place this more advanced hardware uh, techniques. So um, definitely ISAs that are simple lend themselves a lot more for implementing hardware driven type of uh, sophisticated techniques for multiple issue and uh, dynamic, dynamic uh, issuing of multiple instructions. So all this is interrelated. The ISA influences what type of actual hardware design you can you can come up with for high performance, and vice versa. So architects uh, that focus on ISA design they have to have a good a good understanding of what is achievable, and even though they may not be doing the actual hardware design, they need to know what is what is a how to make that ISA that is friendly to sophisticated hardware, hardware designs for, um, for high performance. And this is the end of the chapter. So we are going to stop here and I'm going to see if there are any questions.